by just having this project, it's opening so many opportunities for so many people. It makes me proud. I have two little girls who already know when they pass by a construction site, that's mommy's job. Let's hear it for California High Speed Rail. Well, I, I'm going to um, introduce Brian Kelly. He's going to make some remarks, and uh, then the rest of us are going to gather up here and have a discussion, and hopefully there'll be a little time for questions. And uh, before I introduce Brian, I, I, I just want to say a word about California high-speed rail. In 2009, when President Obama came into office and uh, with Vice President Biden, they had a vision for high-speed rail. And part of that vision was to put $8 billion into the economic stimulus bill. And for the first time in America, we had 8 billion times more money than we've ever had before. And when people would say to me, why is Europe and Asia so far ahead of the United States in rail? The, the very quick, easy answer is, is because our national government has never made the investment in rail the way that the national government in Europe and China and Japan and other countries in Asia have done. And so for us, it was a bonanza of riches, $8 billion. What we needed were good partners. And we found one very good partner in Governor Jerry Brown, who shared President Obama's and Vice President Biden's vision for rail. They stepped up immediately. I, I had many, many meetings with Governor Brown. He, he, was, he was just... Uh, exuberant about the opportunity to connect California with high-speed rail. Without his vision, without President Obama's vision, without Pr Vice President Biden's vision, we wouldn't be sitting here today talking about this very, very important project. Now, I, I know that you've all read a lot of negative stuff about California high-speed rail. In my opinion, most of it is garbage. Most of it is made up. And I, I don't, I, I'll just tell you this. I've been intimately involved in this project since 09. I've stayed involved even what, since I left DOT. There's been extraordinary leadership. And uh, Brian is going to tell you all about it. He and his team can answer any questions you have and disabuse you of any problems that you think exist. The only problem is, they need money. That's what they need. And uh, one of the reasons that we gathered all of you here today and have given them enough time to explain what's going on is so that you can leave with the facts about how important this project is, what it means to California, but what it means to the country and our ability to connect the country with high-speed rail. Brian Kelly, come up and do your thing. All right. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. And I, I want to first say, you know, a very warm uh, sense of appreciation for Ray LaHood and his leadership on this issue. Um, there's no, no doubt that our project has had its challenges as we first started some years ago and we had a uh, a very important step with a federal partner led by the then secretary. And uh, and it's just been a tremendous. And his re-engagement and involvement and full-throated support of all we're trying to do through this association is so appreciated and so necessary for us to keep the work uh, going, not just a key voice in getting the infrastructure law passed, which is now in front of us. And now we're all trying to take advantage to, of that act uh, to keep our work going. And I'm going to walk through what our work looks like in just a minute. Um, but I just can't say enough about the leadership and how appreciative I am. So Mr. Secretary, thank you very much.
Now, with that, I am here to disabuse you. <laughs> of, uh, no. uh, I'm actually here to give you a bit of a presentation about what our project is about now. And, you know, the secretary is right. There's been a lot written about the project, and I like to be candid. It got off to a very tough start. Uh, I came on the project in 2018. The first construction packages moved in 2013, 14, 15. In that, that timeline, they were first executed. And candidly, they got into construction before they were ready to get into construction. And as a result, you got a design build contract in place and you haven't yet bought all the right of way and you haven't yet moved all the utilities. Uh, that's a recipe for problems. The good news is most of that is in our rear view mirror. And as we go forward, we're getting the sequencing and the chronology of our work right. And uh, I'm very proud of my team who's here with me today. And uh, I'm very confident about the future of this project. I'm less confident in my ability to run the PowerPoint, but we'll see how that goes. All right. Like I said, yeah, yeah I might need you. I told you I might need you. Let's see. Hang on. I am right clicking. Anybody? Somebody? Point uh, it towards the back. There we go. I think we're going to start with a brief video. Which one am I clicking? There we go. This is a, a structure that we just completed called the Cedar Viaduct. As you can see, it goes over Highway 99, which is one of our, uh, whoops, whoa, that's one of our main uh, freeways through the Central Valley. The Cedar Viaduct is uh, the most recent uh, structure that we uh, just completed. Uh, that is a pergola. Uh, freight rail goes underneath, high speed rail over the top. I'm not sure why we're getting the imagery in the middle there, but um, these are just shots of various elements. We have 119 miles under construction right now in the, the Central Valley. And I'm about to kill this video because of the, the problems here. But anyway, that's uh, our Hanford Viaduct, a future site of what we call the Galari King Station that will uh, be there. That is a structure that goes into downtown Fresno, known as the San Joaquin uh, Viaduct, uh, completed last year by uh, Tudor Perini. And I think as we get to the end of this video, I can get into the presentation here. I think. Here we go. Okay. So I'm going to talk about the project in three distinct uh, phases. And the first phase, which is the one that we are the first, most advanced on, is in the Central Valley, just by way of reminder. The High Speed Rail Authority in California got federal funding in 2009 and 2010 uh, and through the ARA Act and then later an appropriation, federal appropriation. And it was to start construction right here in the Central Valley, that yellow segment from Merced to Bakersfield. Now, when we first got the funding, the northernmost point was that town, Madera, which you see the second dot from the top on the yellow stretch. And it stopped about 18 miles north of Bakersfield at a place called Poplar Avenue, which is literally an orchard. Nobody's taking a train to an orchard. So when Gavin Newsom became the governor in 2019, uh, when he gave his state of the state speech, he said, you know, we got to get something more out of this project in the valley. And part of that meant we got to get what we would say out of the orchards and into the cities. And so his proposal was to extend in the north to the town of Merced, city of Merced, which now is home to UC Merced, is growing in population, is becoming a housing mecca for people who live in the Bay Area, where housing costs are outrageous, housing costs a little bit better in Merced, and they got to get over the hill every day, which is Part of our next phase. Uh, and then in the south, we added 18 miles to Bakersfield. So now we have a 171 mile segment really connecting Merced, Fresno, and Bakersfield as the first segment of for uh, the first segment of which is all of the San Francisco to Anaheim high-speed rail segment. In California, we refer to this as phase one, San Francisco to Anaheim. It's roughly a 500 mile stretch. It's what the voters of California approved back in 2008, and they largely approved this alignment. And what we've been doing since that time is getting the environmental documents completed. The entirety of this alignment is about 494 miles. And at the end of 2023, 20, uh, uh, we'll have environmentally cleared 465 of those miles. So from San Francisco all the way to downtown Los Angeles. Our last stretch will be the LA to Anaheim stretch, and then we'll finish that environmental document uh, in 2025. But downtown San Francisco to downtown LA cleared. In the Central Valley, 171 miles are all environmentally cleared. 
119 miles, as I said, are under construction. The remaining 52 miles are in advanced design right now. We've completed that Enviro and we're now getting to 30% design for both extensions. Um, we are in design now of the four Central Valley stations, Merced, Fresno, Kings, Kings Tulare, and Bakersfield, as you can see here. And we're getting ready for two major procurements. One is track, track and systems to lay the track on that 119 mile stretch and the beginning of train procurements, which uh, we're looking forward to getting to. Believe me, I've, I've been on this project for five years and there's nothing I wanna talk about more than trains and stations and less about construction challenges. So I'm looking forward uh, to moving on with this, uh, this project. There, I'm still struggling, okay. Uh, the project has obviously had great economic boom in a part of the state that had been disadvantaged for a long, long time. For most of my lifetime anyway, the Central Valley has been sort of a single focus economy on agriculture. High-speed rail proposes to change that, bringing industry from around the state into the Central Valley, and of course, providing new opportunity for employment in the Central Valley. We've created 10,000 construction jobs since the beginning of construction. We have about 1,100 construction workers on the sites every day. 70% of those workers are from the disadvantaged communities. And we have 30 plus active construction sites on any given day. We have a pre-apprenticeship training center in a little town called Selma in the Central Valley focused on at-risk folks, some people coming out of incarceration, other folks who are um, uh, stuck in some tough economic uh, conditions. And we have an opportunity to give them some training and get into the construction trades. And we have 10 trades that teach at each of those Co cohorts. The other thing we're very proud of is the small business participation on the project, 763 small businesses, 237 are DBE or disadvantaged business enterprises, and 90 are disabled uh, veteran business enterprises. So the economic impact is obviously one of the great strengths of this program, and it really happened in a part of the state that needed it the most. I will say that when the federal government gave us money in 2008 and 9, uh, one of the questions was, where should we start? And California submitted four different applications to start in different parts of the state. But the federal government was clear. They wanted us to start in the most disadvantaged community. And that is why we started in the Central Valley. The second segment outside of the Valley is the Bay Area. So remember that that segment of the Valley is about 171, 172 miles. The Bay Area stretch is from Merced going west to Gilroy and then up through what we call the peninsula, Silicon Valley, San Jose, Millbrae, and into downtown San Francisco. That's a 159 mile stretch. Today it's 100% environmentally cleared. Uh, we're eligible to begin advanced design in 2022 and 2023. And I'll make a comment on that in just a minute. Um, we have corridor electrification currently underway on 51 miles through Caltrain electrification project. Caltrain is the commuter system that runs between San Francisco and all the way to Gilroy, they're currently electrifying the corridor between San Francisco and San Jose in the near term for their commuter service and in the long term, the corridor that we will use as we get into the Bay Area and come up the, the peninsula. So that electrification project is underway now and will be completed in 2024, so not, not too far away. Uh, we also are working closely with San Francisco. Whoops, let me go back one. I think I'm going back one. Maybe I'm not going back once. Oh, well, that's a lot better. <laughs> All right. That's good. Sorry. Killing you guys. Okay. Uh, just a couple more comments about the Bay Area. The DTX station is the station in downtown San Francisco in the heart of the financial district. Uh, ultimately, the Caltrain system electrified and high-speed rail will go in to that station today, it serves uh, inter-regional bus services, but ultimately it will serve that station, a single stop to connect those bus services to both the Caltrain commuter service and ultimately high-speed rail, not traveling just in the corridor, but traveling along all of that phase one system. So we've made tremendous advancement in the Bay Area as well on the 159 miles. Southern California is our third corridor in the state. And uh, here it's the Bakersfield South stretch, the yellow at the bottom of the screen. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, much of this is environmentally cleared, this 164 mile stretch. 92 miles are environmentally cleared today, and uh, we will finish 
all the way into downtown Los Angeles from, from Palmdale uh, to Burbank, and we already do Burbank to LA. So all of this will be environmentally clear with the exception of the LA to Anaheim stretch in 23, and LA to Anaheim will finish in 25. Uh, we're working on advanced design now here with, with, in those segments that are envi environmentally cleared. And we provided funding to LA to rebuild the LA Union Station, uh, both to help with regional uh, transit in the LA region today, and ultimately to accommodate the high-speed train service at that station in Los Angeles. This segment is currently unfunded in terms of construction, but we have the ability, just like we do in the Bay Area, now that we finish the environmental work, to advance the design and advance some of the engineering work and do a lot of geotechnical work on the tunneling that's necessary to get to LA from the Bakersfield and Palmdale area. So three distinct segments in the, in the region. The Central Valley is the furthest along. Uh, we have applied for federal funding, a sizable amount. For this year, we applied for about uh, $3 billion in federal funds. And the bulk of it is for construction activities in the Valley, but we have applied for advanced uh, design uh, uh, work, both going to LA and going into the, the San Francisco Bay Area. So we're looking forward to those awards being made uh, at the end of the year. Upcoming milestones for us in 2023 and the years ahead. One, our first uh, most Southern, most construction segment on the 119 miles in the Valley will be completed uh, by the end of the summer of 2023. We'll get into the track and systems procurement later this year. In 2024, we're looking to start the train set uh, procurement. In 2026, the other two construction segments will complete. Track and systems completion for the 119 miles, what we call the test track in 2028. We'll test that from 29 through 30 and completion of the extensions into Merced and Bakersfield and then passenger service scheduled to begin between 2030 and 2033. So that's the layout of our initial uh, segment. And again, at the same time, we'll be concurrently advancing the work into the Bay Area and into Los Angeles. And then, you know, I think there's other conversations we have about money to extend the system into those, those regions. So we're looking forward to that. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. Just know that we're extremely active when it comes to the infrastructure law. Uh, this is various grants that we are seeking. Uh, the one at the bottom is the, the sort of uh, king of all grants for us here is the federal state uh, program. We had submitted one grant for capital of about $2.8 billion, and as I mentioned, $200 million more, $194 million more for the design work to extend into the Bay Area and into Southern California. So the top two, we were awarded a couple of small grants to advance some of our work in the Valley, and the ones all below that are pending uh, now. But again, very active on the grant side. In fact, just at the end of last week, we also, not on this chart, but we submitted a grant to the Department of Energy, a grant application to advance uh, solar panels and uh, battery storage for uh, to both power our trains and for some of the station uh, power needs that we'll have. So very active when it comes to the infrastructure law. And that's pretty much the status of the project. Again, as I said, there's a lot of activity. The project did get off to a tough start, but I think we're we've done a nice job of getting that in our rear view mirror and really now turning in the focus to what's in front of us and uh, making sure that we're doing the chronology right, the sequencing of work right, and uh, being very careful as we go forward. So, you know, I'm optimistic about the future because I think the way we are approaching it uh, presents uh, less risk of delay, less risk of cost, because we're doing it much more methodical, methodical way. So with that, I'm happy to say thank you and uh, look forward to the, the Q&A. Thank you very much. Uh, Greg, why don't we start with you, um, and um, why, why don't you tell us um, about the job implications um, uh, from your point of view, and um, then anything else that you'd like to add. But I, I think uh, we all know this means an enormous amount of jobs uh, uh, for the trades, and uh, maybe you can really... Uh, articulate that in a way that people understand the magnitude of it. Well, I think, um, and thank you for that question. I, I think, you know, you saw the, the numbers up there in the, in the introductory video, 10,000 jobs right now. That's And that's, by the way, just in the construction phase of this, when they're actually uh, building out the system. And for us, one of the biggest promises of these infrastructure projects, especially one like on this scale, 
are that you're not only creating that initial economic impact by creating all these construction jobs, but then you have a long-term operating job, whether it be for the people who are operating the railroads, you have economic activity in some of the communities where you're going to have them going through. Um, and from my perspective, they're all good union jobs too, where these are going to be good paying jobs with good benefits. Um, and in a state like California, that is, um, that is really important. And when we're looking uh, forward, you know, I firmly believe that one of the hurdles we have around the rest of the country in terms of actually doing these types of thinking big infrastructure projects um, is that, you know, a lot of times politicians get a little bit scared of, of what the perception could be. But we do truly need a prove it project um, in the country. And California High Speed Rail is a vital one to show what is possible what it means in terms of economic multipliers in your own state, but then also what you're delivering for your constituents to show them that you can, what the real possibilities are for high speed rail. And can you um, articulate also, um, are there enough skilled workers to build rail around the country? Yes, and, we, and you know, the unions through their apprenticeship programs are creating more and more skilled workers every single day. Um, you know, we have an infrastructure, the best job training infrastructure outside of the US military. Uh, in in the building trades, building construction trades, not apprenticeship programs. Um, so we have the ability to generate that workforce, but we need the demand for it too. So uh, as we'll start to see more investment, and I think the infrastructure law will spur a lot of this on, I think we are going to see a lot more people enter the trades and understand the benefits of, of being in, in, in this uh, industry. And Meg, you want to uh, maybe continue the the dialogue that Brian started uh, with uh, the work that you're doing as a part of his team? Oh, absolutely. So, you know, Brian articulated how transformative this project is for California. And we focused very uh, early on sustainability. So across all aspects, uh, the environment, but also social aspects, jobs, as well as the economy. So we have a comprehensive sustainability program for the high-speed rail system. And as a mega project, it allows us to actually use the power of that project to start moving the needle on some uh, behaviors and practices that really start to speak to the future of the workforce and the future of how we want to be delivering our infrastructure, which is really important in terms of you know, having incredibly clean construction sites where those workers are uh, engaged in. And I'd say what's What's great about California is we have a fantastic regulatory platform to start from, but our board and our executive leadership have really set the bar very high in terms of commitments and making sure we have a zero net construction, uh, zero net construction, which no other project in the United States has or has achieved. And what we deliver behind that as well is proof of concept. We don't just make that claim ourselves, but we've provided evidence to third parties like the uh, Institute for Sustainable Infrastructure to prove that what we are talking about um, is real. And we were really proud of achieving this Envision Platinum Award. It really speaks to all of the ways that we're paying attention to sustainability on the project and have put that into practice already. And it does speak to the communities that we're connecting as well as the jobs and the real benefit to disadvantaged communities that are happening but it also speaks to this vision of not just, you know, we want and will get the shift from automobiles and from air trips onto high-speed rail. We're going to deliver that mobility service. But we also recognize that we need a service that can be reliable. And then the space of climate change with what we're seeing relative to heat waves and fires, and this year, rain and floods and epic, epic uh, snowfall, we recognize that when you're running electrified high-speed rail, we need to make sure that the electricity is reliable. So as Brian mentioned, we've um, put in a grant application this week for funding for a solar photovoltaic and battery energy storage system. And that really allows us to operate the trains unlimited in summer on, these, uh, on solar and batteries. And that's tremendous. We want people to rely on the service. We want people to get... Um, to get home in case PG&E turns off the grid. But we also recognize that for us, it helps us reduce our operating costs overall. This is a 72% reduction in our annual electricity costs by looking at batteries and solar together. So this really, I've given you a, you know, a couple high level elements of our sustainability program, but they are a hallmark to what we're achieving and focused on in California. Brian, uh, 
Can you tell us about the uh, the uh, structure that exists uh, within your organization so that people have an understanding that you have a board? Obviously, you know the governor. That's the vision, and you you're appointed by the governor. But tell us about how. Um, uh, your, your board works and uh, how they're appointed and what role they play in all of these decisions you've been making. Sure. Um, it's evolved a little bit with time, but um, I've got a, a, a total of 11 members on my board. Uh, two of them are ex officio. They're generally the, the policy chairs in the legislature who serve as non-voting members on our board. And then we have nine voting members. Five of them are appointed by the governor and four of them are appointed by two each uh, by the leader of each of the respective houses in the legislature. So the assembly speaker appoints two, the Senate leader appoints two, and the governor appoints five. And the board really does set our policy agenda. I mean, at the staff level, we work to implement that policy agenda. Uh, we provide the board with recommendations and options to move the project and the mission forward. Our board meets about once a month to, to take up various elements of, of running the, uh, the operation and advancing the program. Uh, and they vote for key things like every two years, uh, we issue a new business plan that we share with policymakers in California. My board has to approve that, but it outlines not just where we've been, but it also outlines our policies going forward. And so when the, bo when the board votes to adopt that policy, uh, that guides us for the next couple of years on what we're doing and, and how we're doing the work. And uh, just as a technical matter, my board, five of them are appointed by the, uh, by the governor, four by the legislative leaders, and and I'm technically appointed by the board. Uh, so, uh, so in that structure, it's uh, not so different from some corporate things people are more familiar with, but uh, board CEO structure. But that's that's how we operate. We have when I started with the organization in 2018. This is kind of unheard of in California government, but our organization was about 70 percent consultant. Um, in California government, that's quite unusual. Um, and I don't have a magical proportion, but I did realize that we had to beef up the capacity of our state staff and our public staff, because one thing you can never contract out is ownership, uh, ownership of the project, owner, ownership of, of, of the policy. Uh, and so we had to improve our capacity at the state level. Today, we're about 45% consultant, 55% state staff, and that's going to continue to evolve. It's going to go a little bit more in the public direction. Uh, for a while again, I don't have a, I don't have a magical proportion, but again, it's about getting the balance right between making sure the state agency has the proper capacity to own the project, move the project forward, and make sure we have the right specialty that we need, the specialization that we need, and some of the quick uh, work that we got to get done where consultants are key. So we'll always have some of each, uh, but we've had to evolve that project. That Brian, time. also talk about the. Uh... Uh, the decision making by the legislature and their involvement. Uh, uh, I know when Governor Brown was there, he persuaded them to, to to put some money into this project. And I know that since Governor Newsom has been governor, he also persuaded them, along with uh, a lot of the citizens that that got behind. Uh, but I think it's important for this group to know that this is not a project completely, totally funded by the federal government. You've got a lot of skin in the game. California taxpayers have a lot of skin in the game. And just talk about that uh, so people understand uh, what that means. Yeah, no, I appreciate the question. We, you know, we have a very active legislature and we should on this project because uh, our project is funded 85% today. Our budget is funded 85% with state of California dollars between a, a bond bill passed by the voters uh, and what we call our cap and trade program, our cap and trade revenues. Au auctions are held every quarter and we get about 25% of each, each quarter's auction. Fortunately, in the last year or so, that's been about a billion dollars a year to this project. So it's, a, it's an important revenue source. Now in California, that revenue source expires in 2030 as we're sitting here today. So we have work to do. We have to extend that or we got to find other sources of state money but look, I think everybody in this room knows no mega project of this magnitude uh, it succeeds without a strong federal partner. Uh, it's true for the interstate highway system. It's true for uh, major airport improvements. It's, it's true for all kinds of mega projects. And 8515 is, you know, in favor of the state. 
is not the usual recipe for advancing a project of this magnitude. So again, it speaks to the importance of the passage of the infrastructure bill, the opportunity that it presents. And we're being very candid. I just got up, came back from Capitol Hill uh, this morning. We're being quite candid. Like this is the year we have to have the demonstration of the federal partnership and we have to have it in 2023. I'm trying to move this project as I showed earlier from being 119 miles, that's not a great operating site to a project that's 172 miles to start, to start that will actually move people and connect cities. And that's what we have to have. And I can only do that if I have a federal partner. And so we're, we're applying for big bucks. We need big bucks. And if we get it, I think it improved my ability at home to go back to the legislature and get the state back in the long-term game. But so part of it is a timing issue. Some call it chicken and egg. Uh, you know, I think we've already demonstrated in California, we're all in on this with the magnitude of investment that we're making. Now's the time to get that federal partnership uh, uh, strengthened and demonstrated. And we'll go back to California and talk about what we do next. So for me, the project has always been San Francisco to LA and Anaheim, and it still is, but we don't have all the money to do it right now. And just like every major transit project I'm aware of, you build what you can build with what you have. And so we want to do the first 172 and we want to grow from there and, and get the whole thing done. And so that's ultimately the objective. Uh, I had a meeting earlier today on the Hill and somebody asked me, you know, how many riders will you have from San Francisco uh, to LA and Anaheim? And even in the post COVID era where transit and rail passenger ridership has been hit a little bit, you know, we, we expect to have 32 million riders between LA and San Francisco. That's substantial. And uh, I think it's conservative. And so uh, it's really important that we're able to move this forward and the opportunity is now. And again, getting back to your original question, you know, the legislature in California, most of them want to see the full project done. You know, in California, this thing passed with a vote of the people in 2008. That vote was about 53% for, 47% against. Last year, a poll was done on, do you still support high-speed rail in California? 56% in support, 35% against. So in my view, we're making progress. <laughs> anyway, Let, let's throw it open to questions. Uh, and uh, anybody? Um, yes, sir. Down here, front row. Start out by saying there's a lot of negative intent. A lot of crap. And I, yeah, I, I think I used the word garbage. Garbage. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> okay. I'll pay better. Similar, attention. synonymous yeah. term. But what, what my question is, is what can all of us do? Uh, obviously, we're trying to build an industry, right? And um, trying to build a mode of transportation of which this country doesn't have. So what can we do as you know, partners, as, as uh, what I would call shareholders in the industry, to help refute that negative narrative and help reshape that to give the facts to help, you know, further, not just this project, but other projects that are coming down the pipeline. You know, for where I sit, it, you get, it, I had to first start with what's the reality. And the reality is the project did get off to a tough start. I mean, like I said, they, you know, for reasons that are understandable, they, they got into construction quickly. And in part, it was to spend the then federal money that was received under some tough deadlines. And so they had to get that money to work. The upside of that is that in a place like the Central Valley that had very little economic, you know, option, you know, uh, getting this project going down there meant a great deal. I think in 2017, the stat that always sticks with me is one in three jobs in Fresno County were on this project in, in 2017, one in three uh, in terms of the growth of the jobs. And so th it served its function to get moving and get something going and employ people. The problem was you're building a mega project and work is being done out of sequence. And on a, desi on a design build project, that's a killer, right? But here's, here's, the, here's the reality. We're moving past that. I mean, how long do you want to stay in the rearview mirror? I mean, again, we, 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 we understood that problem. We've taken steps to address that problem. Going forward, we are resequencing our work the correct way. We're extending the design now so we know the next right-of-way segments we need. We know the next utilities we got to move, and those will be done before the next construction contract. So again, meth, you know, we are doing it the right way going forward. I feel very optimistic about that. Some of the criticism that came before, 
you know, it's earned in terms of the reality that we were having struggles and, and we were. But again, you move past it, you acknowledge it, you make organizational changes and you and you roll through it. And so and below, everybody in this, no, this is a huge project, 500 miles from San Francisco to LA through seismic zones, through coastal areas, through the valley, through the mountains. Guess what? There's going to be challenges. We are going to have challenges. But I always feel like I, I came to this from a political background. I, I spent 18 years working in the state Senate and the legislature. And one of the big projects we worked on before, because most of my members were from the Bay Area, you know, we re rebuilt the San Francisco-Oakland Bay Bridge. That was another big project with all kinds of challenges and all kinds of problems. But, you know, the Bay Area today, people look at that structure and they go, how do we ever live without it? And that's the safest damn bridge in California. So it's, you know, you go through the struggles at the time, but now it's about we're emerging from that. We're coming out of that. The future is brighter. And the biggest thing that everybody in this room can do right now is get on the federal folks about these grants. we got to have the grants. we got to have the federal partnership back in place. And with it, we will succeed. But we got to have it. Remember this, it took 50 years to build the interstate system. 50 years, and there were governors back then. If you look at the history of the interstate, there were governors, particularly in the Western states, we are not having a road built through our state. We're just not. But then as the citizens saw what was going on and how the country was being connected, boom, that was it. And uh, in the end, I do think uh, the California Assembly has really stepped up in an enormous way in response to the citizens. And that's why it's so important for all of you in this room uh, to, to hear what's going on, to get the facts, and to be a part of the, the team that's going to build this. The gentleman here had his hand up, and then we'll, we'll keep going towards the back there. The gentleman right here, ma'am. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, you've got the unenviable position of being approved at project for the US High Speed Rail. Um, there's a lot of people in this room are involved in sort of new high speed rail projects. I was just wondering for those new projects, what are the key lessons learned you have from this really so How much time do we have? Seven months of success. Yeah. Well, look, I, I, one, uh, I think you really got to spend time on planning in front of the work, right? That we, we jumped, we ran before we could walk. I mean, that's my, my, you know, rear view mirror look, I guess. But I think we ran a bit before we could walk and uh, quickly got into some construction contracts at risk. And uh, because of the chronology of the work, uh, that risk came to fruition. And so we dealt with that. So I think the first thing is plan the heck out of it before you start going, right? And then once you're in it, once you're in it, make sure that the chronology is is right. You know, do take your time to get the steps correct, and uh, what the risk you eliminate early is the 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 freedom you have later. Uh, and so I think for us, we've learned that the hard way. You know, it was a, a tough beginning on this, but again, I really feel like we've learned some tough lessons. We've described that publicly. We've been quite candid with our policymakers about where we've been and where we're trying to go, and. Uh, you know, in some ways you put out tough news when you're on a project like this. But, you know, if I go back to that Bay Area, that Bay Bridge for just a minute on this, you know, that that pro that earthquake in San Francisco struck in 1989, okay? That bridge opened for the public in 2013. It had 24 years to build a bridge, okay? But again, today, everybody's thrilled that it's there. Uh, and during that process, during that difficult mega project, one of the lessons that I took from it, I was in the legislature then working for Bay Area members. And then later I was the secretary of transportation in California under the Brown administration. And that project was having its struggles. But one of the lessons I learned on that was I think we give the public too little credit. I, I think most people at home know that a huge infrastructure project is going to have challenges. Our job is to tell them what those are and what we're going to do about them. And that's the lesson I took from the Bay Bridge. And it's the lesson that I bring here. And I think anybody who's ever remodeled a home or a bedroom or a bathroom, they know. And so, you know, times that by a thousand and, and you know you're gonna have challenges. But I think it's important that we're clear 
on what we're intending to do, what challenges we have, and uh, what opportunities we have. And so that's- I, I also think that a real advantage that California had is it was tested by the people. The people passed a referendum. They had their say. And then in a subsequent poll, in spite of all the negative publicity and problems, they continue to support it as is being borne out in the California Assembly, which continues to support this uh, in, in, when they're having very, a lot of difficulty with, with, with their other fiscal issues. The gentleman here and then the lady in back. Yes, she's coming with a microphone, please. I'm for it. Uh, uh, you know, my view on that is that to make that happen, there's two things that have to have to occur first. One, we have to we have to eliminate a lot more risk that's on this. I, I don't. My my sense is that the private sector. The only person who, who hates risk more than the private sector is me. But but so I think until you show that a lot of the riskiest parts of this are managed or otherwise fully mitigated or out of the way, you're gonna you're gonna it's gonna be some time before you get private investment. The other thing is I think they want to see some demonstration of operability first. And I think we have the opportunity to demonstrate that on the 172. One of the reasons I, I've been pushing since I've been here to complete the environmental work and get into advanced design work is the more you could show others what, what this will look like and what it will take to get done, and you get the risk of the right of way, the risk of the environmental out of the way, I think you can then open up better conversations with the private sector. And so for me, it's it's not it's just about being methodical enough to get enough of the public parts of that work resolved so that we can then talk about do we have a do we have an opportunity for a, a private partner? Ma'am in the back. In the last row there. Yeah, thank you. This is for CEO Kelly and President Reagan. Uh, when we talk about transportation, one of the greatest crises we face is the lack of a qualified workforce. CEO Kelly, I'd like to congratulate the authority on being named the Employer of the Year from the Women in Transportation Seminar. I think that's just an incredible success. And <laughs> Bureau of Labor and Statistics indicates that less than 70% of the current workforce in rail are women. Yet over half of your staff and the majority of your executive team are women. What do you attribute that success to and what are the best practices? And then I'd love for you to answer that too, Trustee Regan. Well, for me, it's it's a bit selfish, right? I want, I want to expand the net as wide as I can to get the best talent. And so that's what that's been our approach. And uh, you know, I've been able to get people like Meg Cedaroff to come in and and uh, and take over our planning sustainability work. And across the board on the executive team, I've just got, I think, the best talent in the state of California uh, working for us. And and you know, whether it's gender or other lines, I think that the 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 issue of you know diversity and and cats in that net wide. To get the best talent is 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 in our interest. And it's a self interest. Is to make sure that the organization is as strong as it can possibly be. So that's been the philosophy of of what we're trying to do, and it's been nice and rewarding to be recognized. Uh, but I think it's important. And I, I also just come at as I said, I used to work in the legislature back in the early '90s, and part of my job there was when folks were appointed to head agencies, mostly in transportation. You know, back then. They all look just like me, right? And that in a state like California, you know, that's just not 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 wide enough that net. And so that's mostly what we've been after, what we've been trying to do, and it's paid off because we've gotten really good talent at, at the authority. Yeah, and I think um, when you when you look at how do we diversify certain aspects of the transportation workforce, um, be it under gender, racial lines, whatever it may be, uh, you know, someone a friend of mine who works in one of the building trades unions told me once that. Uh, apprenticeship programs are an incredible tool for diversifying and bringing more people into the workforce, but only if you make it a priority. So there are some that are really good at it. There are some that you know make sure that this is our goal here is to not only get more people trained and, 
and into the into the industry, but also that we're going to proactively reach out to people from different backgrounds, so that people understand the benefits of uh, joining our industry. And I think that comes from leadership. It's leadership from both the union side and from the employer side um, about proactively advertising what is so great about working there. Um, and conversely, when you look at a number of industries in transportation, whether it be uh, you know, the freight rail industry right now, whether it be public transit, um, when what most people see are the bad things, you know, the assaults on bus drivers, uh, the, the really nasty uh, bargaining fight that happened last year on freight rail, when that is the advertising for your industry, you're going to have a really hard time getting people to come work in it. Uh, so a lot of that comes from, again, leadership. It comes from better management on the corporate side. In the public sector, it means making sure that you're embracing policies that are going to make the workplaces safer, more welcoming, more conducive to uh, not only recruitment, but retention in whatever the industry is. Yeah, other questions? Here, here's a question here from uh, from Andy. Before uh, the mic gets up here, is Dan Richards still in the room? Dan, stand up. Dan was the original chair under Governor Brown. Uh, thank you for all your good work. Speaking of that, thank you, Brian, for your leadership on this. It's been incredible. Could you talk a little bit about, because um, there's a question about the, the speed that the project is getting built. Could you talk a little bit about how that is intimately tied to the speed of the funding that's coming? <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, it's like I said to the legislature, if we had all the funding from day one on this project, we'd be a lot further along. But this has been a challenge the entire time and you know, in California, there's a peer review group that comments on all of our business plans. And I think for every two years, for the past 16 years, they've told the legislature, you got to fully fund this thing. <laughs> and so it's a, it's a fight for dollars uh, uh, all the time. We were successful during the Brown administration in, in really getting the, the ongoing source of money, which is, I mean, it really is that cap and trade money. It now means about a billion dollars a year to this project that comes in through these quarterly auctions in, in the cap and trade side. And, uh, and that's our only ongoing source of revenue right now. The rest at the state level is we're exhausting the bond dollars that were originally passed in 2000, 2008. We're down to about $4 billion left for those. And so, you know, what we have to do in the midterm now is we have to perform. We have to deliver on the milestones that we are setting. And, and we have to get this demonstration of a federal partner. And then with that, we know we have to have other conversations at home in California about how the state can see this through. But uh, so we just have some things that we have to uh, line up and get through. But it, it has been a it's been a challenge of like finding the dollars where you could find them. And, you know, Dan Richard was the, the chair when the cap and trade dollars were uh, set for this project and his work and uh, Jeff Morales' work as the then CEO. And, and of course, Governor Brown's operation on that was tremendous. But that got us going to, to be able to keep keep surviving. And, as John Picari once said, a mega project is like a series of near-death experiences. And so <laughs> when you don't have the full funding, it really feels like that. So. Thank you. Hi, uh, Mikey Paul with the Brotherhood of Railroad Signalmen. Uh, thank you guys for all of your insights. They're fantastic. Um, you were talking about federal funding. High Speed Rail Labor Coalition. It's all of the rail unions together in a coalition form. We would love to talk to you guys. I know it's going to be way in the future, but you're going to have to have a good workforce when the construction is built. And uh, each one of these unions have come together. We are the field subject matter experts in each of our crafts. So uh, just, this is more a comment. We would love to get together and have a talk with you guys and uh, see what maybe we could work out some type of an arrangement, MOU, something going forward. Thank Absolutely. you. Thank you. Absolutely. Well, and to your credit, I mean, um, you have come spoken to us, our, our unions, both on the rail operating side and the construction mm -hmm. side several times in the past, and we'll keep, we'll keep making those happen. Um, and, you know, what, one thing we've emphasized as, as lab, in the labor movement, um, you know, 
we have been advocates. We fought against, you know, the bad amendments to try to kill the electrification process, for example. We fought for continued uh, to try to keep it when, again, when there was a number of people in Congress who were trying to kill it every turn. You know, labor was right there fighting with you to try to do it. But, you know, part of the understanding from the beginning has been it's also better be a labor friendly place when it comes to the operations side down the line. You know, we're, we're going to we can be partners, but we got to be real partners. And that goes both, both ways. Partnership is extremely valuable. Yes, uh, this gentleman here in the second row. Well, wait till you get the mic, sir. Thank you. Hi, Alan Ownsman with uh, Forbes. Uh, Brian, I, could you elaborate just a little bit um, when you're talking about segments that have been environmentally cleared? Yes. What does that cover and how does that relate to acquisition of, of the land? Yeah. So in California, we probably have the most extensive environmental process of, of any state, our California Environmental Quality Act, uh, which is a process where you go through and uh, you work with the communities that will be impacted by the uh, by the system, and you identify uh, all of those impacts, and you identify necessary mitigations that you'll you'll have to make to to make the project work in those areas. It's a different process, but it's in California we do it concurrent with the federal NEPA process. So we we try to do them both together. And I should say a thank you to the to the federal government for allowing us to do a streamlined NEPA CEQA process. It's, it's been very helpful. But that, that process takes years in California, years, especially on a project of this magnitude. So many of the environmental documents that were underway when I started, and we're just getting completing them now. So it, it gives you a sense of, you know, these are decade long conversations uh, through these communities. But getting that environmental work done is important for a couple of reasons. One, uh, the cost and the time of that is now behind you. And secondly, you, you, you've identified the alignment and now we can go in and we can start the further design work at, at the environmental level. The design is about at 15%. We wanna take it up to 30 and start to identify, okay, now on that segment, what, what are the right-of-way parcels we need? What utilities need to be moved? You know, what are the third-party agreements that we have to engage in? And so we, for example, on just the Merced and Bakersfield extensions now, Having cleared that environmentally, we, we are now in the advanced design of those processes. By the end of 23, on each of those extensions, we'll have a full right-of-way acquisition plan ready to execute. We'll have a full utility relocation plan uh, ready to likely do an early works contract to move. Uh, the one thing that we need to see for us before we do that is to make sure that we have that federal partner in place so that we can move on these extensions. But, but the work will be done, the design work out to 30%. And then we will make a decision with our board about do you want us to do the full design or you want us to get in a procurement method where somebody else may finish this design. And so that's a conversation that we'll have later. But for now, we're just trying to get fully configured footprint, full understanding of the right of way, full understanding of the utility relocations, segment by segment. Uh, and then as we move those, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll start to get into the, the next steps. So we, we call it the stage delivery process, if you will, or used to be called stage gate process, where, you know, just go through these stages in a very disciplined and methodical way, and that's what we're incorporating. Yes, sir, here, right in the front. Hey, um, thanks for the panel, it's very interesting. There was a couple lines in the, uh, the last status report talking about municipal financing or possibly tapping into that. Can you talk about that a little bit? No. <laughs> well, because I, 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 I don't know. I mean, we're not, huh. I'm not yet tapping into any municipal bonds on this project other than the bonds that the state of California has approved. Uh, and for now, until we figure out what's next on, on our state contributions going forward or huh. how we'll apply federal funds, you know, I, I'm not sure. I think, what I would say is this, what's important for us to, to as we get into the more, the, the next steps of this project, one of the reasons that we have to, we have to get the state funding to go beyond this 2030 date, you know, a lot of reasons. But one key one is we also wanna take advantage of very favorable federal financing options, RIF loans, TIFIA loans, things like that. And we're gonna need a revenue source for us to do that. And so um, that's going to be really important for us as we go forward. But I don't, I don't have a particular municipal bond. Hmm. 
Yes, sir. The gentleman here, this will be the last question. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thanks very much. So California is obviously a, a leader, not just in implementing high-speed rail in the US, but in learning how to implement it. And if, if I understood you right, it was about a 10-year learning curve to really get to the more effective stage where you knew how to do it. My question is, do you think that other states are going to have to start at the base of that learning curve? Or do you think they can start at 50, 70, 90% of what you've learned? And can you think of any ways to help them get above zero when it's their you know, turn? We're a proud case study. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I mean, look, I, 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 it's not that complicated in terms of, of the, the challenges that, that this project was, was presented with. And as I said, I think, you know, again, in California, we went to the bonds, we had a bond and went to the voters right away and said, you know, you guys want to do this? The voters said, yes, we're off and running. But uh, I, I think there's a great value in, in really getting the, the planning uh, further along before you're into the full funding and financing part. Um, I think, uh, I, as I, I mentioned before, I just think some of the early uh, challenges with the chronology of events, you know, which we can do differently. I think everybody does. Uh, I think it's better not to have strict expenditure requirements on federal funds because they can provide a, the wrong incentive. Uh, and so I, I hope that doesn't continue going forward. So, you know, I, you know, in some ways we are a bit of a case study. And, and I think, you know, we have to, I, I don't mind being that for others. We've learned from it. Others should learn from it. But I think because we started, I think uh, every state uh, will be in a better position because of what we learned. If I'm, if I may say, you know, that's an example. Of, I, I sure hope other states can work from that. I sure hope that, you know, we don't lose, that we don't, uh, you know, forget all of the the heart, you know, the hurdles that were put in place along the way. Um, but I also think it, it's, it shows why strong federal leadership is so important for these types of projects. I, and we see it in, again, in a whole bunch of other agencies where when you have strong federal participation where they are being not only a source of money, but also a source of leadership about how to, you know, help people along on projects. That can be true in transit projects, can be true in high-speed rail, uh, airport construction, you name it. When you have an active, knowledgeable uh, federal government that is a resource, not strictly a, you know, a uh, you know, regulatory hurdle or a check signer, when you have that resource, that, that, that leadership there, I think it can really prove immensely valuable. Um, and it's something we've been trying to focus with this DOT on is as you start to see money go out the door from this infrastructure investment and jobs act, we start seeing all that money go out the door. We can help you and, and you should, along with the, the, the recipients of this grant money, identify those really great actors, the ones who are doing it the right way, that are creating the right amount of drop jobs, you know, training enough people, doing it in the greenest way possible, identify those case studies as the best actors. And then advertise that to the rest of the country and make sure that you are providing that sort of examples of what good leadership is. Let, let me just uh, wrap this up by saying we wouldn't be sitting here talking about this project if it weren't for the vision of, of this administration and the ability of the president to persuade Congress to pass a trillion dollar transportation bill with $66 billion for rail. That's 66 billion times more than we've ever had for rail in this country. And, and if all of you are as impressed as I am with the ability of California to continue to move this along, I hope you'll join Brian's team as advocates, not only to the federal government, but to your colleagues. This is a legacy project. This can become a model for the rest of the country and other places in the world. And so help me thank them for the leadership they're providing to make this happen. We're done. Yeah. One question.